Good morning, DrupalCon. Good morning. Did you have a good time last night? Yeah? Yes? Okay. Well, I guess the ones who had fantastic times, well, they might not be here yet. Um, but yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, I'm glad to see that everyone is so fresh and awake. Um, well, I, I know that having eight hours sleep, you know, it helps. Um, yeah, well, I just have a couple things that I need to mention today. Um, just some, some quick, uh, quick details. There. Uh, first one is that one of the sessions from yesterday got moved to, to today. We've updated uh, the website. The printed schedule cannot be updated, as you can imagine. Um, so if you want to see that session, make sure that you are there at the right time. The second detail, it's something that I've mentioned yesterday. Um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, we've had some issues uh, yesterday in the morning, so people could not post those se session evaluations. It's, uh, it's very important to us that you do take the time. So if you want to post a session evaluation, go to the session detail page. And on, at the top of the page, there's going to be a link that says provide feedback on the session. Just click it. It takes about 30 seconds. There's like five quick questions. It's like rating things from one, five, one star to five star. You know, it doesn't take much time and it provides a lot of very, very valuable feedback. So please take the time to do that. Third point is the questions for the keynote. We are going to collect the questions via Twitter. So just post your questions on Twitter with the hashtag AskAnkD, that's uh, AnkD, that's uh, Anke Domchalsberg uh, Twitter username, in case you're wondering what this means. So post your questions on Twitter. We will be collecting those. Make sure that you post your questions once. Posting a question 15 times does not help uh, well, it does not help anyone and does not guarantee that your question will be actually asked. So we will pick the best, sessions, uh, the best questions and ask them at the end of the keynote. As you can imagine, organizing a DrupalCon, it takes a lot of different components. And all of these are very important. We need to have a good location. We need to have the right people to organize the event. We need to have the attendees. We need to have the speakers. And also, we need to have sponsors. Sponsors are, well, a very important aspect of, of making such events possible. To introduce today's keynote, we are going to have Peter Guagenti from Acquia. And please help me welcome Peter on stage. Good morning. A little bit of housekeeping before I get to do the uh, short sponsor pitch. And uh, it has to do with an unresolved question from uh, yesterday's interview with Dries. Uh, and it has to do with Dries's hair. Uh, <laughs> so for anyone who's looking to be like Dries, the product is called uh, Garnier Fructis Extra Strong Putty. Uh, sounds like some sort of construction product, if you ask me. Um, we will actually start making these available alongside Drupal t-shirts at all Drupal cons from this point going forward. Uh, so you too can be like Dries. Uh, another side note, I did borrow this from Dries and he said, you know, that's really important to me. I think I might have to hold your passport. So as Florian mentioned, I'm Peter Guagenti. I run the products team at Acquia. Um, we've actually, this is our 10th DrupalCon that we're, that we're sponsoring. We're incredibly proud to be part of this community. We really appreciate the opportunity. Um, we actually have a number of new products that we're showing here at DrupalCon. We would love for you to swing by the booth and uh, give us a chance to show you what we've built and give us your feedback. I'll highlight a couple here. We have a new version of Acquia Search that we launched a couple of months ago. Um, some pretty significant changes. Uh, Search is built on Solar. Uh, we updated the version of Solar in order to improve performance and add some new capabilities, but we also have done things like 
moved it into our own managed cloud environment instead of dedicated servers so we can actually serve Acquia Search from any Amazon data center around the world, which improves response time. Um, we've also improved some usability, and we now have support for Search API. I know that's a, there are a number of folks who really care about that. Uh, we also have this great product we launched earlier this year um, called Insight. And what Insight does is it, it monitors over 100 different parameters on your site to proactively notify you if we see security, performance, or other issues with your site. Um, <coughs> I had someone in Denver ask me, they said, you know, so what are you really checking here? It sounds like all these things are things I can check myself. And I said, okay, well, 100 parameters, you're going to take a couple of days to figure that out. We check every time cron runs. So uh, trying to automate the mundane for you. We also have a prototype of Drupal Commons 3.0. How many of you have used or seen Drupal Commons? Um, so Drupal Commons is a social collaboration tool that's, that we've built in Drupal. Powers things like dev.twitter.com or um, the World Economic Forum or others. Um, we have a new version that's rolling out with improved usability. This is the, the functional prototype. Uh, we would love your feedback, so please swing by the booth and check it out. Um, and last but not least, uh, once again, how many of you have heard of Acquia Cloud or use Acquia Cloud? Um, so we are officially unveiling a permanently free tier for Acquia DevCloud. So uh, this is uh, coming available in the next couple of weeks. Come to the booth, give us your information, we'll notify you as soon as you can, we can give you an access code. Um, this will be free for life for developers like you. So you'll be able to go in, develop on Acquia Cloud, use all of our tools and all of our workflow. When you're ready to go to production, you know, then you'll have to find the right sized equipment for what you're doing, but you know, great, great service for you as a developer. So, thank you. So, enough of the sales pitch, right? Uh, so, I, I'm pleased to introduce uh, our keynote speaker today. Uh, I'm going to try to get Anka's name right. Uh, Anka Domscheitberg. Uh, Anka is uh, an incredible individual. Uh, she's both an entrepreneur and an activist. Uh, she's been working tirelessly over the last 10 years in order to really help break the glass ceiling and help more women uh, end up in leadership positions in large organizations around the world. Uh, incredible activity and one that was awarded with a Woman of the Year Award in 2010 by the state of Berlin. Um, Anka is also the founder of OpenGov.me, a company that's focused on consulting and best practices for open government. And she's going to be speaking today on how governments and citizens are using technology to improve both transparency and accessibility and democracy. So, Let's give a warm welcome to Anka. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here and an honor to be invited to speak. I hope everybody is really awake after a beer evening in Munich. That's always a dangerous thing to talk at the morning after. I want to talk about something I consider really relevant for everybody, not only those sitting in this room, but really everybody living on this planet. I want to talk about how digital democracy will change our lives. You will have to bear with a little introductory theory at the beginning, so I want to present what is open government, just very briefly, so you will not get bored during this uh, introductory part, to make sure we all are in the same frame of reference and know what we are talking about. And then I'd rather talk about the practical aspects from those two angles, how you can open up government, top down, by gov open government strategies from governments themselves, or bottom up, if they don't do that. And last but not least, I want to make sure you take home those bits which I consider most relevant. Little summary, so to say. So let's go into the one-on-one -on -one for open government. As was already said, open government has a lot to do with transparency. But what is meant with transparency? It means various things. It means, on the one hand, open data. I'm sure most people know what open data is. It's making all data in the hands of the public sector public, in machine-readable format, cost-free with an open license, 
to be used for any use in raw format. So that, that is open data. Only two types of data are not to be published. And this is personal data. And it's data which has special requirements um, in terms of security. But transparency is much more. It's not just open data. It has a lot to do with transparency on how our decisions taken in government, how our laws made, for example. It also has to do with what happens after the process. What actually is the outcome of a specific decision taken in politics? For example, investments for recovery. Did it actually lead to more jobs? Did it change something to be better? It sounds like no-brainer questions, but most governments don't really report with facts on these simple questions. So transparency is about that, too. The second pillar of open government is collaboration, is using Web 2.0 tools for more interaction, for new types of collaboration, which outside government, we all are already now using nearly every day, but within government, that's still rather an exception. And we talk about collaboration, for example, on exchanging experiences, collecting knowledge, getting access to collaborative knowledge, things, simple things like wikis, which are not used in government, nearly not. So we talk about new collaboration in one public authority, but we also talk about collaboration across boundaries of one public authority. And that can even cross federal levels. So municipalities can work together with state levels. State level can work together with federal levels. That happens in some forms, but it does not happen in a very frequent, effective, and internet technology supported um, way. Another type of collaboration goes even farther. It means collaborate on really content issues with people outside government. And that is the barrier which is hardest to break down because governments usually like to stick with themselves and not really expect insights, innovation, good contributions from outside the government. And that is exactly the thing which is changing now when governments turn to citizens for other ideas. The third part of open government is participation. Very often participation is translated to something like e-voting, where you ask citizens to decide whether they are in favor or against a certain political decision. That's a rather digital yes or no decision if you want. That of course is participation, but if you consider participation to be something like an iceberg, that's just as much. It's the tip of the iceberg. But the big part of it is rather asking the people to get input, to get input for decision-making, for consultory processes, discussing with people and really listening to what they have to say. And that is much, much more than just asking a yes or no decision, and it can be done much more often than the first variation. Participation means also something else. It means mobilizing people to do something with using internet tools to reach a common goal, can be a political goal. This can be things like bringing people to protect themselves better in healthcare issues, or to break down social barriers in education, things like that. So desired goals on to make people do something for it and to use e-participation means for that. So that was all of the theory. You are done with it now. Um, the whole open government took place in 2009 when rather the Anglo-American world, um, especially President, US President Obama on his first day in office, started with uh, bigger open government initiatives. And you can see Two of the biggest ones, the most famous ones, open government platforms are actually built with Drupal. And that is the whitehouse.gov one, and it's the open, national open data portal in the United Kingdom. 
This is when the first national open data portals popped up. And in the left lower corner, you see a platform from Australia where the government interacted in the way I described beforehand with citizens to ask them how they, within government, could do their job better. It was also at this time when websites popped up, for example, in the United Kingdom with names such as tellusabetterway.com, which exactly brings across this change in mindset that outside government are people with great ideas for inside government. This openness was really new and social media were used to work together with the people to get ideas. Now we are some years farther. We have a global initiative where people work together. 55 countries are collaborating in these so-called open government partnerships all over the world. They have to commit themselves to specific things to join this open government partnership. Germany, by the way, is not a member yet. We try to lobby for it. So if you meet Angela Merkel, tell her we should do it too. What you have to do to become a member is you have to publish a national annual action plan and not just a blah, blah, blah kind of plan, which we all know very often exists in public sector and politics especially. But these have to be plans with concrete measures, with commitments, with measurable commitments, and the action plan, as well as the status quo measurement at the end of the year, has to be done with intensive involvement of the civil society. My personal suspicion is that that's why Germany is still not a member. They find it still a bit difficult to ask the people and involve them in big decision makings. It's all about sharing knowledge, experience and tools. So when these decision makers from 55 and it's getting more and more countries meet every six months for bigger meetings to exchange what they've done and what worked well in their environments, they could be talking about a platform built on Drupal 2 and it's all about sharing. So how is it done top-down if it works well? This is a map showing open data portals all over the world right now. And you can see at one glance, it's no longer an Anglo-American idea. It has spread all over the world. On this bigger map, you see just the open data portals in Europe. So it's growing. You can read nearly every week or every couple of weeks news that there is another one coming. The big one, the most famous one, the one from the United Kingdom, just had a relaunch. And it really changed in the last couple of years from being a portal providing data for experts, which is and was a very great thing to have at that point in time, that provided developers the opportunity to develop applications using this data, make sense out of it, visualize it, create services out of it. And it's still there, this functionality within the portal. But since then, it's gone a really long way. It's now become a portal much more addressed to a broader um, kind of people. It became a transparency portal for citizens where you can find much other types of information which people are interested in. And as I said before, it's done with Drupal. So I'm not sales pitching here, but I think it's for you interesting to know what are good examples using that technology. Which is new for the UK portal and is also demonstrating the degree of openness and unthinkable in Germany still today, is that the official national data portal is including data which actually comes from outside, from an NGO, from who is lobbying.com, for example. Um, that's the, what kind of lobby people, ministers are meeting every day and you can compare which minister meets more people from industry and which industry sends the most people to lobby um, appointments with ministers and things like that. And we know all 
the latest after ACTA, how relevant that type of information is. So now you find that on the national open data portal too. But with one click, you also find information on political goals and on specific commitments within goals. With these commitments, the UK government wants people to give people the opportunity to measure their success. And if you click on one of those goals, you get a pop-up with much more information on exactly what is the status of each of the measures in terms to reach these goals. What you can also find on this, and some people are really interested in it, is in a, a kind of upgraded org chart. Many people really don't know what the heck are these people in government doing. They might still not know after reading this org chart, but they have a little more insight at least. So they can click on every one of those little tiny boxes and they can read the description of responsibilities. The curious ones can find out how much pounds this or that person earns in that position and form an opinion on whether that's worth the tax money or not. But you can also find the email address and the direct telephone number of each of those people working there. In Germany, that would be rather difficult today. So summarizing the UK open data portal as a very good example, what you see there is typical for recent open government platforms. They are really modular mesh-ups. They combine information and data coming from various sources and they make use of a lot of interactive means to talk with citizens and with the government. And if that sounds familiar for Drupal people, that is a good thing. Why is data important to have? Most people cannot make much sense of long lines of numbers. I'm one of them. I prefer it if numbers turn into pictures to start to to speak for themselves. Most people find it easier to understand visualized data. And for those people to understand complex content, and many political decisions have to do with complex content, like how is tax money spent, it's not an easy thing. Many people find it easier to understand that with this type of visualization, like this one, which where does my money go? in the UK provides. So at this little slider on top, you can adjust it to your annual salary. And then you can find out how much tax are you paying in the year, in the day, and how much of your personal individual daily tax goes into defense compared to, for example, education or culture. And then it sounds a bit more relevant to you personally, and it's easier for you to have an informed decision and take part in public discussions about these matters. Open data can also unleash innovation potential and bring new innovative services for just everybody else. This is just one I want to present. It's one I particularly like. It's from London as well. In London you can get rental bikes and you know that it's became painful and expensive to ride cars at the city center. So many people get really using these bikes, but you only can get them from specific racks where they are um, locked and you have to bring them back to one of those racks. So it's an important question to know in the morning when the people from the outskirts take the bikes to ride into the city center, where actually is a, ride, a, a bike I can take? So what you want to know is where is a full rack, because it means there is a bike in it. These little dots, the red ones, mean there is a bike in the rack, it's a full rack, and the bigger the dots, the more racks are there with bikes in it. But then, if people took one of those bikes, and many do it in the morning, some hours later, it's real-time um, information, so that's just screenshots from some hours later. They all move to the city center, and then if you have bad luck, all wrecks are already occupied. And you sit there with your bike and don't know where to bring it, um, the closest possible to your office, probably. 
And then you can turn to this little application and find where is a free rack and get rid of the bike and go to work. And later in the evening, it all repeats itself. People bring back their bikes to the outskirts and then the racks are full there. Some are still full in the most interesting um, parts of the city where the nightlife takes, takes place. You can see that as well. So it's a very nice little application showing how it can be useful just for everyday life. In the European Union, EU Commissioner Neely Cruz even quantified the use of open data. There is debate going on whether that number of 40 billion euro, which she estimated and published for potential value creation just in the EU for opening up public sector information. So there's a debate about that, but really, I don't care whether it's 10 billion or 40 billion or 60 billion. It is a lot of value, and it's not just monetary value, it's many other values as well. But the EU realized that this idea is good for Europe, and that's why there exist European plans. They have been decided upon, for example, to go live with the European Union open data portal still in this year, to give out specific rules on how open data should be done in European member states. But they also give away 100 million euro just for new projects and research to promote and realize open data in European member states. That started already last year, but it's still going on this year and next year, though there are opportunities. The rules which will most likely be amongst those defined rules for open data in Europe, um, that it has to be machine readable, which makes all sense in the world, that it has to come at no extra cost for users, with very few exceptions. That's a hard thing to swallow for the German government as well, if it comes like that. And it has to be open for any use, not just non-commercial and private, no, for just any use. We see collaboration on open government even going one step farther now. There's a cooperation between the United States and the Indian government. They cooperate on an open source, open data portal. It was due to be launched something like four months ago. It's still work in progress, but it will definitely come. You can contribute to it. Um, it's developed on GitHub and it will be used for the national open data portal in India but then it will be usable for just everybody, every state, country, whoever wants to use it to build a fast and effective open data portal, they can just take it. And you would like to know that it includes Drupal 2. But I said some governments don't move fast enough. Some don't move at all. So what happens then? In a digital democracy, in our nowadays society, people take initiative. They just do it themselves. If they don't see happening what they expect from government to happen. So they start leaking documents which they miss and don't see. So they create transparency themselves if you want. They even create laws they miss sometimes. I will show you one example. If they don't like some laws or drafts for laws, they get rid of them. Sometimes it works. They get rid of ministers or leaders in the political sphere they don't like. They monitor political accountability and create publicity for when it goes wrong and um, how they see it. They fight corruption bottom up if they don't see their governments doing it. And they get organized to do so and push open governments from bottom up. And they do so not only within one community or one national country, they do it across borders. And when they see something somewhere else, could be another continent, they just copy paste it if that's possible and do the same in their country. For each of those little examples, you all know WikiLeaks. That's how it started after Cryptom, which is a little older. Leaking now became, regardless of what happens to WikiLeaks or not, leaking became an option for opening up 
government secrets bottom up. Secrets which people believe do not deserve to be secrets anymore because they have to do with corruption, they have to do with power abuse, they violate human rights and everybody should know that, like in the collateral murder video. These things have to be made public. Things like environmental crimes, so-called secret public contracts, we had some of those in Germany which were made public and afterwards the government published the same contracts. So they had to follow the desire of the people. But even when citizens see that their money, it's our money, public budget is tax money, and that's wasted, we should know about it and we should do something about it. And these things now can happen in many ways. The brown envelope got digital. We also want to know what our politicians are doing every day in the parliament. You probably know opencongress.org, which is a really great um, community page in the US where you can follow the money trail for um, politicians. You can see who voted what, what is discussed today in parliament. There is one little thing in Germany as well doing that. It's the parlometer. And the funny thing is, it comes from our second national TV station and they provide it on their online channels. And yet you can see um, who voted what, the colors um, are political parties. Hopefully the next election you see an orange one as well for the Pirate Party. Um, and then you can filter even by how did married parliamentarians decide versus non-married ones, those with kids versus those without kids. Eastern and Western with lots of other income sources and those with no or less income sources. These are interesting information and you can here on this little tool relate them to the political decision making of those members in parliament. Sometimes when governments don't provide official open data and national open data portals, people try to collect it themselves. That is something we saw in Germany where there is a quite uh, vivid open data, open government community going on with various NGOs, one of them I'm working too, who try to push the government with lots of direct interactions where we meet people from the Federal Ministry of Interior. There are people who listen, but processes in Germany are really slow. They always want to do it perfect and sometimes perfection needs forever and that's not such a good thing in the internet society where having a better version B-E-T-A version uh, is sometimes better than having a perfect one years later. We want it faster. We didn't get it faster in Germany. So the Open Knowledge Foundation in Germany created often a daten.de, which means open data.de basically, and just got data where it was distributed somewhere on, on lots of other public authority portals and they put it together. It's supported by the Federal Ministry of Interior, actually, um, as much as the Federal Ministry supported the first national apps competition, apps for Germany it was called, but they didn't want to organize it themselves. I don't know any other country where such a national kind of apps for democracy competition has been done by NGOs. It's usually done by the government itself and we wanted to have one in Germany, but nobody did it. So eventually we did it ourselves. Three NGOs worked closely together, but the Federal Ministry of Interior joined a so-called community public partnership with us. And only with this partnership, civil society working together with government on this one common goal, having an apps for Germany competition, that was really successful. And we used the offnadaten.de platform to collect data for this challenge, for this competition, because clever us, we not only had entry possibilities and prices for ideas and for applications, we wanted more open data in Germany. We wanted more public authorities giving away their data for just any use. So there was a third category and that was data and we got the Federal Ministry of Interior to using their own letterheads and sending their letters 
with invitations to take part in that competition and free public authority data. They sent these letters to many, many public authority and that worked very well. And on the platform of nadaten.de, we collected all the data we received during this competition, which of course remained open after the competition as well. But we also had, or the Open Knowledge Foundation collected data they got from other sources. Like with all apps competitions, you could see many, many really good and useful outcomes. One of them you see in the upper left corner, radiation levels. We got the um, hourly measurements from radiation for all over Germany. And there was a little um, app developed to make this data visible in a really nice way. My preferred example of what people can do and how they can succeed in doing open government themselves comes from the north, from the state of Hamburg. Citizens in Hamburg for a longer time tried to push the Hamburg state government to open up, to make a transparency law, to tell their own public authorities to publish contracts, to publish plans for infrastructural changes in the city, things like that, but it didn't happen. So what they did, they opened up a public wiki to draft a law. I don't know whether you have seen something like that before. I haven't. I have seen drafts of laws being published somewhere and people could come and that exists in some regions, but I've never seen people, citizens themselves, sitting down in a public and open wiki and really writing a law. But that is what they did. They wrote a law to ensure transparency in government. It included things like publish all contracts with third parties which involve tax money being spent, which is above a certain threshold, of course, lobby impact made visible, all these things. This was, was a collaboration driven by many initiatives and organizations, even some political parties from the opposition took part, the Pirate Party as well, the Greens, the Chaos Computer Club was involved and others as well. They collected signatures by citizens to get the opportunity to take part in the, there's a formal process within the state of Hamburg where citizens can, uh, can end up deciding something. So they collected enough signatures in a very short period of time, 50,000 it was, to get the first stage of this referendum process. And still at that stage, the state government showed rather ignorance and was not really interested in supporting that. They thought they can just sit and wait and it will go over. This can sometimes work, but sometimes it does not work anymore. You can't sit out the people anymore if they really want something. So the due, to, due process said that there will be a referendum if the state government does not create the law itself within the period of, I think it was something like three or four months, they didn't do it. So there was a referendum schedule for end of this summer, end of August, could have been these days, theoretically. And then the community, the initiative with all these organizations taking part, they really powered up. They have a very, they had a perfect plan in place how to spend all time from April to August with every week having something taking place in the state of Hamburg with publicity, with public events, talking to citizens, convincing citizens. And there was so much support coming from really everybody else in the city that the government started to worry. And that is the point where they started to negotiate with this initiative. And they sat on one table. And then in a period of just a very few weeks and very few changes to the draft of the law, they thought it may be better to do the law themselves instead of having the people forcing them to do something which they openly opposed to. It would be just a shame for them. And that's what they did. Not even one year after the wiki was opened and started, that law became a law written 
by the people, the government forced to adopt it, and the mayor of Hamburg went to the press and said he is so proud, it was an anonymous decision, we are the most transparent city and state in all Germany, and I don't care whether he takes the credit as long as it makes the government becoming more public. And as I said at the beginning, people look to other places. So what do the people in the state of Berlin do? They look to Hamburg and they say and ask, why don't we have such a thing? We want to have a transparency law just like that in Hamburg. And dear Berlin government, if you don't do it, we might do it like they did that in Hamburg. And it just spreads like a disease, like a really good one in that case. <laughs> well, we had another case, a very famous wiki in Germany, the Germans all know it. We had a federal minister called von und zu Gutenberg, who just copy-pasted his doctoral thesis. Many people took a lot of time to research and compare line by line his doctoral thesis with publicly available sources to find out what and where he copied from. If you wonder what he copied, in this little colored barcode you can see it. If you have good eyes, the white lines are the text parts he wrote himself. <laughs> Not too many, and it became very embarrassing because that was a process which evolved. At the beginning, it was more white, and then it became less white, and even less white, and even more less white. So the day came where it was just too shameful for him, and he just had to leave. He tried to get back into politics. It didn't work because we, the people, did not want. These things can work. It makes sense to fight against something you don't want to have representing you. And then we had, of course, the case of ACTA. The fight against ACTA became more intensive when the first ACTA draft, which, believe me, was 10 times worse than what was discussed in the last months, when that was leaked on WikiLeaks in 2008, not everybody might have heard about that at this time, but the relevant communities, initiative and NGOs working on the topic of fighting against censorship and these things, and keeping the internet free as we want it and as we know it, they worked with this proposal. It gave them the ammunition to analyze what is there on the horizon and to use the time until it ended up in parliaments, like the European parliaments, to use this time to be perfectly prepared to just dump it. And it was done in many ways. There, for example, is the German Freedom of Information portal, of course, not coming from the government. It comes from bottom up. It's called fragdenstaat.de, ask the government. And this was used for a freedom of information request, it's very easy to do it with this platform, it was used to ask who in the German government took part in the negotiation rounds of ACTA in the last years. And the answer was declined, the response being this would endanger public safety. I don't know whether you get the danger, I didn't understand it, and the people did not want to take this as an answer and publicly money was collected to get into a legal process to force this information to become transparent and public. You all know things that happened besides that one. The digital citizens used all sorts of viral means and techniques to get the message across because they understood it's not enough if just the informed communities fight against it. It's not enough. We need the ordinary citizens, and we need to educate those citizens in a way that they don't understand, and that's probably not with all those complicated uh, scriptures. It's rather more, again, visual, explaining in little videos and pictures, what does that mean for us if that law comes through? It means bypassing democratic process, like one of those YouTube videos said. And then we have things like AVAS, 
that global petition platform, it's not working on national levels and that is the future. The internet has no national borders and more and more citizens understand themselves as digital citizens living in a more global world. They don't care about national borders and that's why they join also those global campaigns in sign because they consider an issue to be a global issue and they as a citizen have to do something in favor or against it. And that was the case with ACTA 2. No ACTA 1. There were nearly 3 million signatures presented to the European Parliament before it had to decide and debate on ACTA. It went all over the news. That is what you need to have at the end that everyday newspapers and media are reporting about it because not everybody sits on the internet every day. Many people still just read printed paper. They watch TV and you need to reach these channels to achieve real change. But that happens with the start and the other media. And that's what happened in this case and eventually we, the people, we won. And then we had that other example, the SOPA in the United States, Stop Online Piracy Act. It's once again the copyright excuse used to try to monitor people, to censor the internet, to steal us the freedom we so much enjoy. And in the internet, in the United States, at the SOPA Opera platform, somebody related the information and that shows you how important open data is. They combined the information on how much money that members of Congress get from specific industries and how have they said in public is their opinion on SOPA. And these columns you see, the long one, that was the I am pro SOPA votes in Congress. And you see it's much longer than the opponent's list. And on the price tags, I call them, on the heads of each one, it's too small for you to see, but on the platform Sopa Opera, you could see, I call it price tag because I mean, you could see how much money they got from the industry and you could see a direct correlation, an embarrassing, a shameful correlation between the voting they intend to do and the money they received from the benefiting industry. But at least we could see it. And that made us really get angry. Really angry, I mean. And that led on the 18th of January to the Internet Blackout Day, which I'm sure everybody of you has noticed. More than 10 million petition signatures were sent. Millions of calls were made just from one tool, from Wikipedia. Many people, many websites turned black on that day, including Wikipedia and other really big websites. And I believe it's the combination of masses of people opposing something, but also industry, in brackets that also means money, yeah? also industry fighting against it, that made the members of Congress magically change their mind within 24 hours. Money always tries to make laws, which is a sad thing, but the least thing we can expect is that we see how it takes place so that we can take action in time. So for example, in California, there is in place the Global Warming Act, which prescribes that in California, CO2 emissions have to go down to the 1990 levels by 2020. And guess what? oil and gas companies don't like this law. So what they do want is get rid of this law and they just try to achieve this by buying votes. And here you see the money trail. If that's not too easy to see, I explain it to you. The big lines are big money, small lines are small money, and the big lines all come from oil and gas companies. They paid more than $10 million to get a new proposal which would mean getting rid of the existing Global Warming Act. 
Making this visible, again, makes people angry, shows you the impact of money on what our representatives, ours, the people's representatives, what they are doing in their political work. And we vote for them or we don't do it. And then we have tools of fighting corruption. Corruption is a problem, I would say, in every single country in the world. It is a problem in Germany. It's a bigger problem probably in India, where it's a really, really big problem. It's hindering development for the society in India. And the government declares every single year how much they want to fight corruption but either they don't really want to do it or they are not really effective in doing so because it does not happen in the pace that people expect it to happen. So what somebody just did, they built a platform called I Paid a Bribe and people can upload information on when and where and why they had to pay a bribe. And these are things like that, a railway engineer who describes how he got a contract like always only by paying a bribe and then the public civil servant engineer came and told him let's save some of the concrete and make 50-50 on the savings which is as you know a very dangerous thing to do on constructions so that good guy didn't do it but he made it public on this platform and this platform collects all the data and you can sort the data and visualize it and see what regions are more corrupt than others, what types of offices are more corrupt than others, but you could also see the contrary. You could see which ones are least corrupt and you can learn from those and exposing these black sheep hopefully in the medium term leads to the reduction of these things to happening. I believe that black sheep can only hide in the dark. The more light you have on them, the less of those black sheep you will see. And finally, open government globally is very often copy-paste. If you take a very good example from the civil society in the United Kingdom, it's called mysociety.org. Many people, if not all, will know it already. They produce many of those little tools which are very useful to get forward, bottom up with open government. One of them is whatdotheyknow.org. It's a platform where you, can, where you can do freedom of information requests to your government in a very simple way. You get a form, you can fill it in, you can much easier identify which governmental authority is responsible for this information and sits on the data. And you can formulate your request in a way that it's very hard to tell you, no, I don't give it to you because it's not my day today. It makes it really hard because it already has all the paragraphs stipulating your right on getting that information within this pre-written request, you only fill in um, some parts of it. And this bit, like everything else what my society org is doing is open source. So that was too fast. Um, countries all over the world, including the European Union itself, copied that platform. And you see even the fragdenstadt.de platform I showed you in, in Germany, that's all done on whatdotheyknow.org. It's reused. That's what we will see more often and mysociety.org has lots of these things to offer, not only on transparency. It's like the open data portal in UK. It's moving from just providing information or helping to provide information. It's moving into tools which allow for real transactions between citizens and governments where you can report problems in public transport, for example, or things like Fix My Street, which you may know, which now exists in many, many countries and cities in the world, where people can report problems with their municipal infrastructure and get them fixed. Yeah, now I want to make sure that you really remember the things I want you to remember. Because I know that you can't remember a 45-minute talk, that it's too much wanted after an evening full of beer, maybe. Maybe even without beer, I guess. So what I consider the most relevant things, which I try to bring across in this keynote, 
is my optimism. My optimism that transparency is the future of government, is the future in our democracy, and that secrecy and corruption have much harder times because of that. Because transparency is contagious globally, and if we see people having it somewhere, we push our governments together where we are as well. We can, much easier than ever before, join forces. Now in a digital way too, we become really powerful. We can force governments like never before. We become so powerful, we can no longer be ignored. Governments have to listen to us if we are loud enough, which of course implies we have to do it. Not to sit and be bored and do nothing, watch TV and read colorful, I wouldn't call them newspapers. Um, do something. Fight for it. It's for all of us. Governments will have to understand that open government is not a if we want to do question. It's a when does it take place question. And it's a question of do we as governments have a stake in it? Do we sit on the steering wheel? Do we have a part in it? How is it shaped? How do we do it? Or are we forced to do it? And somebody else opens us, the government, up from bottom down, which we may not like so much. But if we understand, we now meaning the government, if we understand we have to do it, we'd rather do it ourselves because it looks, looks much better. It is just the due process, I would say. But if they don't do it, we do it for them. And, which is good for this community sitting here, I believe, open government in general has so much to do with openness, with collaboration, with sharing, and so much to do with open source that should be really good for this community. Tech community, because of all of that, is a key enabler in this. I'd rather call it a revolution. Others say it's rather an evolution. I don't really care. It's a very big change taking place. And you can be part of it. You should be proud of it, that you can do that, that you can enable and fasten this process because it not only means interesting business for you, it means you taking part in making our society a better place and improving our democracy so that more people have a say and contribution to it. This is what I want you to remember. Thanks so much. And if you have questions, now is the time. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, tweeting like crazy. Paul Johnson and myself were sitting in the back, uh, basically getting all your feedback. Um, and after a while, we noticed that really uh, certain issues are on your mind, certain issues are, are binding. Um, we figured out five questions, five questions that basically bring the whole thing together or, or, or maybe is on, on the mind of the audience most. Um, Privacy, of course, is an issue. And regarding privacy, um, privacy and correctness, how do we know that open data is not enriched or misquoted or presented out of perspective? Well, we, but we don't know it for sure, but since it's raw data and it's public and it's transparent, everybody can find out. Um, often, sometimes, opponents of open data say, you can do everything with data. You can always present it and visualize it in a way that supports your opinion. That may be true, but everybody else can do the same. So after all, you have a fight on truth, a fight on data. But what do we have now? Now we have a story in a newspaper. It says something is like it is, but do we know whether it is like that? We don't know the data. We only see the message. Now we can look behind the message and look at the data itself. And we can look at interpretations of multiple interpretations of one set of data. There may be different ones, but we can see the differences between it and can put it into perspective. 
If we, uh, if we take that one step further, then should it, that's actually also a question that came up a couple of times, should it be up to private companies then to basically analyze this raw data and, and, and not the government itself? That should be up to everybody else. I mean, open data means it's open. It's there. It's in the world. Everybody, everybody, governments, companies, citizens, civil society, everybody can use this data and play with it. Do with it whatever they want. And hopefully many do it coming from different angles and this way representing the diversity of our society and all political opinions we have and find there. Of course companies can come and use data for their own purposes, but civil society can do the same. And if that's a different goal, we will see that in the interpretation. Governments can do it as well. Never should somebody say, that's what we have today, it's the old way of doing it. Never somebody should say, here's a set of data and only you get to analyze it. That's not how we want it. We want it open and we want it to be used for everybody else. There's uh, two or three of you guys asking the question, are there any risks for government or society related um, to open raw data? Have things ever, have, has it ever gone wrong? Um, or for that matter, should certain data not be open? Um, I don't remember a single case where it has been made wrong, except if I count the cases where it, ha where it has not been made open because that is making it wrong. So as long as you publish data and respect two really important guidelines, nothing can go wrong. But these guidelines are important. And the first one is no personal data is involved. It's no data on persons. So if we talk about healthcare data, it does not mean Anke has this and that disease and this is how it developed and this is made public. Um, it does rather mean, for example, statistics on how can you treat cancer and how's the outcome between this hospital and this hospital so you can compare output, but not related to individuals. So that is the one set of data you do not want to publish. The other set of data has to do with security. Now sometimes people say for some data it may be true that national security or individual security can be at risk if you publish a certain set of data. What we see now is secrecy being this big and openness being this small. What we need is to put it the other way around. The default is open, the default is public, having data public. The exception is these two sets of data which we do not want to have public. What we need is precise, concrete guidelines where to draw the line. What means national security? It does not mean like the decline for the one freedom of information request to make names of governmental officials. I mean, it's their job, so why shouldn't we know uh, that they have been in the negotiation rounds of ACTA. This is not security relevant, but there may be others, other data which is of security relevance, you know. Um, we need the help to draw this line, for example, from data protection officers. They are the big helpers for the open data community, although it sounds like the contrary, it's not. The Data protection officers are friends of open data and they are experts on telling where is private individual personal data involved. They know best where to draw the lines and we have to ask them for this because they, what we do want, we want a transparent government but a transparent government does not mean a transparent citizen. We don't want transparent people. We don't want surveillance. We don't want to be monitored in everything we do. We don't want that. And that's why we also have to look very, um, with a lot of attention to this privacy issue, that this line is really drawn and that government is not doing what they try to do every single day in nearly every single country to step across the line and to get more surveillance, more transparent people. The government is there for us. It's not the other way around. That, that brings us to an, another point. And you notice that many of these people here, of course, they're working with data. They're, they're building Drupal after all, right? Um, the question that comes up then is, should it be up, uh, sorry, 
can open data be manipulated by government, by citizens, by interest groups, um, or what does government do then to create an established trust? I believe that openness creates trust. At the moment where you publish things, you put the basis for trust. As long as you hide things, you give room for interpretation, room for suspicion, and usually there's a reason for that. Secrecy enables bad things. More secrecy, you see more bad things happening. More manipulation takes place as long as things are not published. So what we talk about is, not, is, is rather how to reduce manipulation also in governments by making more things public. And when data is public, I don't think the danger of manipulating on the side of the government is so big because so many people can look onto it. It's like you try, to, um, you try to do something stupid in, in open source code. I mean, so many people look onto it. Somebody will find out and they will make it public. They will say, hey, look, how can this data be true? Last year it was this. How can it change in one year like that? It doesn't make any sense. Explain why that is the case. And if they can't explain it, they get into trouble. So with open data, manipulation becomes much, much less likely. So I, ho I hope that answered the question. I think so, yes. Brings me to my last question. Um, if government is to become a Drupal customer, some of them are, but most of them aren't yet, um, what technical features, what kind of functionality would be, would be most important? Is there anything specific that Drupal would, be able, would, would need to be able to do in order to become a, a perfect open data yeah. government tool? I'm grateful for this question. I had a, an, an email conversation with somebody who is building Drupal platforms for the German federal government. And um, I was asking that person, what do you like of Drupal and what could they do better? Yeah, so that's basically what you want to know. And he said, it's really good that it's so modularized and that you can mix things how you want them to mix on the platform, that it's um, front end not interfering with back ends and it works very nicely and you can, um, you can adhere to many governmental standards, for example, accessibility and things like that. So that seems to be pretty easy with Drupal, but he said he sometimes seems one issue and that is that many modules seem to collect a lot of data of the people using it and that sometimes developers don't know how much data overall is collected but that is a problem for governmental platforms because they have extremely high levels at least in Germany levels of um, privacy requirements not to collect data from people which use a certain platform there seems to be too much data collected using um, Drupal products. So if you could look into that problem, maybe talk with governments, where do you think it's too much and how could we change that? That is probably a good idea. I guess, we, I guess we'll take that one home. Actually, no. that guy is here in the room. If he wants to out himself, he can... Oh, where are you hidden? <laughs> wave the hand. Right back there. Okay, there he is. But so if somebody wants to talk to him, he gave me that really interesting input. Okay. All right, wraps up my five questions. Florian? Thank you very much. And there's one thing you mentioned when we were setting things up on stage here. You said that you would like to have one of those t-shirts. And so we went up front and we got you a nice women's size t-shirt. It was great to have you here. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure.